Now we focus on normal force and frictional force. Now, both the normal and the frictional force are forces that are exerted by the surface. Right. So the normal force is the force exerted by the surface to keep you from sinking into the surface. Right. And the frictional force is the one opposing movement or the tendency to move. So if you are moving in that direction, then there on this, between this, the surface will exert a frictional force. Right. And if it's moving, then we can going to call it a kinetic frictional force. Now, since you've got two forces exerted by the same surface, right, the surface is doing this, you need to specify if this is perpendicular or parallel to the plane. So when you look at the definitions for normal force and the definition for frictional force, right, you will see that perpendicular and parallel is required in that definitions and that is because it's both the surface exerting that force so you have to specify if it's the perpendicular or the parallel one right now let's look at the normal force how do I work out the normal force so when you are working with different situations you need to know which situation you're working with because that will determine how you work out the normal force if you have only horizontal forces Right. Say, for instance, you are applying a force to the teapot and there's a frictional force, no other forces in other directions. Then it means in the vertical direction, that teapot is not moving up and down. So in the vertical direction, the net force must be zero. And that means the only way for that to be zero is if that normal force is equal to gravity. So you have to say normal force equal to gravity. If you wanted to write it down neatly, you could have said upwards as positive would be net force is adding all the forces together. So you've got your net force, uh, sorry, your normal force upwards plus minus the gravitational force because that is in the negative direction. And then you would have get, um, arrived at that one. But that is not necessary. You can just immediately start with this. Next one, if you are pulling, it means you've got an upwards Y component. So I'm throwing away that force. It's not in the direction of movement. I'm replacing it with a Y and an X. And the Y component is actually helping that surface to keep you from sinking in. So when you do that, the normal force will be smaller. The normal force will be gravity minus the Y component that is helping to keep you from from sinking in next up i've got someone that is pushing if you are pushing then you have a force that's not in the direction of movement we're replacing it with an x component and a y component and now since the y component is down you are actually pushing this object harder into the ground and the ground will have to do more to keep you from sinking in. So here the normal force is going to be bigger. It's going to be gravity plus the Y component. Right. Then the very last situation there is where you are on an inclined plane. There we said it's not the applied force that's a problem. Here gravity is the problem, right? And we're replacing that gravity with a perpendicular, sorry, a perpendicular and a parallel component, right? And now the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So if the surface is over there, then your normal force is perpendicular to that. And now I'm going to say in that perpendicular direction, there is no movement. That object is not moving up. It's not moving into the block. So in that perpendicular uh, direction, the net force should be zero. And that will only be true if my normal force is equal to the perpendicular component of gravity. So there you've got the four ways that you can work out the normal force. Um, there might be others, but this is the basic situations that you can get. So just remember that the normal force is not always equal to gravity. Just check to see if there's a Y component helping or hindering the normal force. Now to, to see if you are comfortable with this, we are going to do two questions. So now is the time to pause this video and then come back once you've done this just to mark. Right, now when you did this, 
I hope when you read, you write down. Now, first off, you've got a car, and they tell you 1,000 kilograms. Going to put it over there, that 1,000 kilograms, so that I don't have to reread, right? Then they tell you it's pulled by an 8,000 newton force, and the up an inclined plane, and they give you the angle to the ground. So they give you that angle of 30. Right, immediately, this is going up an inclined plane. And what do I know about an inclined plane? On an inclined plane, the normal force is always equal to gravity perpendicular. So this is equal to gravity perpendicular. And for gravity perpendicular, it will be the whole gravity times cause of that bottom angle. So we end up with a 1,000 times 9,8 times cos of 30 and that gives you 8487,05 Newton. Next one, we have a 23 kilogram suitcase, 23 kilograms over there and it is pulled by this guy with a 180 Newton force at an angle of 55 but be very careful, 55 to the vertical. So they're giving us that angle as 55 and I actually like to work with the bottom angle because I know sine and cos for the bottom angle. So for this one, just subtract from 90 and that will give you 35 down there. Right, and now he's pulling. So we've got an upward normal force, right? For pulling upward normal force, that means my normal force is going to be smaller. So we will have a normal force that will be gravity minus the y component. Now for gravity, that will just be 23 times the 9,8. And for the y component, now if I'm using the bottom angle, then I will always use the whole force times sine of that bottom angle, right? And if you work that out, you end up with 122,16 Newton. Right, then we're moving on to frictional force. Now, that was the one that's parallel and that was the one that opposes the movement. Right, now, if you look at your information sheet, you will see there are two different kinds of frictional force. Right, there's the static frictional force and there's also the kinetic frictional force. And in there, you will see this little funny thing that we call mu, right? Mu is the coefficient of friction, right? The frictional coefficient. And you've got the static one and you've got a kinetic one. And then you can work out the frictional force with that friction coefficient that they usually give you and the normal force that we've just learned how to calculate. Right, so this is working out the frictional force for static and for kinetic, but the difference is with the static one, you have that max word in there, and that tells you you can't necessarily work out that value of the static, of the static frictional force. You can only work out what will the maximum be. Now, when you look at the two, they've both got a mu there, but what you need to know is mu s is bigger than mu k. Now, what determines mu? Right? Mu depends on the smoothness of the surface. The smoother the surface, the smaller the mu. Now, if something is standing still, now, when we look at something, we might think that bottom surface is very smooth, but that surface is actually not smooth. It's actually, if you look really close, if you had a microscope over there, you would see that it is um, ups and downs, right? And obviously the surface that it's standing on is ups and downs as well. So if it's standing, then it's sort of more stuck and sunk in and that will make for a bigger friction than when it's already moving and a little bit above moving around, right? Not as sunk in. So the mu s is always going to be bigger than the mu s and that is always making the static friction or at least the maximum one bigger than the kinetic one, right? Okay, so something else, frictional force also depends on the normal force because it's in there. Now, when it says it's independent of the contact area, if you have something standing like this 
and you take that same object with the same normal force because it's the same gravity and the same forces working on that and you turn it on its side you've got a different contact area but if this surface is as smooth as that surface it means that the mu here and the mu there will be the same whether it's static or kinetic doesn't matter the mu is not influenced by the surface area and you can't see area is not in there right so the contact area does not influence the frictional force only the smoothness as and as long as this one is as smooth as that one it does not matter that that one's got a bigger surface area right and next up it's independent of velocity when you get to the kinetic friction it does not depend on how fast the object is moving the kinetic frictional force is always the same right now with static we have the maximum over there and that does not mean that that is the the magnitude of the force at that moment it just means it's the maximum with which it can resist so for an object on a surface you might work out the kinetic friction and get eight newtons and then obviously for static max you will have a bigger one right so the kinetic uh, one is always smaller than the static one. So that means if I start pushing over here, if I only push with two, it can resist with 10. So then it will not be moving, right? So if I have a graph here of how hard I'm pulling the applied force and how hard is resisting, what is the frictional force, then if I'm pushing with two, that will be resisting with two. It's not going to resist with 10 and push me over backwards, right? It can resist with 10, but it will only do what is necessary. So if I'm pushing with 2, it will be resisting with 2, right up to the maximum that it can resist. If it can resist with 10, if that is my FS max, it means I can push up to 10 and that object will not move. It will be standing still and it will be experiencing a static frictional force but the force will have different values it will only be as big as the force i'm pushing with right but then the moment that you reach that maximum the moment i go and push harder than that if i push 10,001 i am pushing harder than the maximum resistance and the object will start moving but the moment that it's moving now remember it's a little bit on top of the surface now we have the kinetic friction and that is a smaller value right and also that is a constant value it doesn't matter how fast i'm moving it will have the same constant value right guys now to see if you understand this i need you to do question 1.4 pause your video and come back when you've finished now, in 1.4, they're telling us that a crate of 10 kilograms, going to write it down so that I don't have to reread the paragraph, standing on the floor, it's got a static and kinetic frictional coefficients, all that and that. So the mu s, they give us as 0, 0,2, and mu k, they give you as 0, 0,18. Right, and now they tell you John exerts a horizontal force to the right on the crate. So I don't know if he's pushing or pulling, but he's exerting a force to the right first question there draw a labeled free body diagram of all the forces acting on the crate so if you look at all the forces free body diagram free of a body right what's happening you have a gravity pulling that crate down you have the normal force keeping it from sinking into the ground you've got the applied force by john to the right and you've got the frictional force to the left right so that is a label diagram if you want to use other labels that's not recognized by the department of education then you will have to tell them you are using n4 normal force or whatever but all these are accepted labels right next up we're looking at number b calculate the magnitude of the maximum static friction right so i want f s max and for that, we have an equation, mu s times n. Mu s, this time, that is 0, 0,2, normal force. Now, since I only have horizontal ones, 
moving in the vertical direction it's not moving up and down in that direction the answer should be zero for the forces and that tells me that that normal force is equal to gravity so for the normal force i'm just going to use the magnitude of the gravity so that's going to be 0 0,2 times 10 times 9,8 and we end up with 19,60 newton and that is the maximum amount of force that it can resist. Next up, number C. Calculate the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force. So here we will have if k equals mu k times n. Mu k, they've given us 0 0,1 k8. And then the normal force is once again equal to gravity, which is 10 times 9,8. And that gives me 17,64 newton. Right, number D. John exerts 18 newtons to the right on the crate. Will the crate start to move? Well, he is exerting 18, but this crate can resist with 19,6. So the answer is no, and the reason will be that the applied force is smaller than that static maximum. And then they ask you determine the type and the magnitude of the frictional force. Now, since it's not moving, it's going to be static. And now they want the magnitude of that force. Now, it can resist with 19,6. But if I'm only pushing it with 18, it's not going to push me backwards over with 19,6. It's only going to do 18 as well. Right. And remember, you actually have to have two places after the comma. Right. Next up, number E. Now they tell you John exerts 20 newtons on the crate. Now instead of 80, he's now pushing with 20. And what do we know? It can only resist with 19,60. So at that moment when he pushes with 20, it will move. So the answer is yes, it will move. And now the reason is that applied force is now bigger than the maximum static friction. And they ask you to determine the type. Right now, the type of friction will be kinetic because it's moving. And what do we know? Kinetic is always 17,64 Newton. It doesn't matter how fast it's moving. It will always be 17,64. Right, moving on to number F. Now they ask us to draw a graph of the frictional force on the crate versus applied. Now, it's always y-axis versus x-axis, right? So, let's start with the y-axis. So, here they want frictional force, and that will be in Newton, right? And on the x-axis, they want applied force, and that will also be in Newton, right? Now, what do I know? As long as it's not 19,6, it will not be moving, and if I do 18, the resistance is 18. If I do 2, the resistance is 2. So we have a straight line with gradient 1 right up to 19,60 because it can resist with 19,60. So up to 19,60. If I push 19,60, whatever I push, it will be pushing back with the same amount, right? It will be resisting with the same amount. But then I reach that maximum value. So all of this was static because it was standing still. But the moment that I push harder than 19,60, this object will start moving. It will immediately not be static anymore. It will now be kinetic. And that is a constant value of over there, 17 comma six four right so now it is kinetic and it doesn't matter how hard i push or how fast this object is moving once it's moving the kinetic uh, friction will be 17 comma six four right and then we move on to the last question and now they tell us the crate is turned on its side and now the contact area is reduced how will this influence the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force? It will not. It will stay constant. Remember, it does not depend on the contact area.